You've heard. You've heard. You. Okay, not bad. Four to five people at least. That's not bad at all. Uh, anyone here who's experienced an Ayurvedic treatment? You have. That's interesting. How was the experience? Nice. All right. Interesting. So, you know what we've done now uh, is I'll give you a brief explanation on how this whole workshop is. So, I am an Ayurvedic health coach and also a gut health expert. And I run a healthcare center called Prana, uh, which is on SV Road in Bandra West. Uh, we are a gut health and a colon cleanse uh, specialty clinic. And we have about 3,000 herbs from the 650 medicines that we made. All these medicines are without steroids or drugs or antibiotics. They're all made, made of herbs and they're plant based. Fun. We also have 1,700 different formulas for cleansing the colon. So, you know, right now, colon cleanse is becoming a base. People are doing colonics with water, coffee, lemon. We do not advise you to do those things usually because it destroys your good bacteria and your bad bacteria, which is not good. You need your good bacteria in your gut. The microbes here are responsible for your gut health, mental health, emotional health, and your physical health. So you've heard about how important the gut is, right? So today's workshop, we're going to talk a lot about the gut, about the colon health, and then we're going to talk about how Ayurveda can help you fix your gut and colon health. Yeah? Um, I'm going to ask you to look at the picture that we're giving you. Please give me a pamphlet. Um, can I have that pamphlet? Yeah, that one. It's a very interesting uh, research material that we've got from Harvard and Stanford. Uh, it talks about how 90% of the diseases that we have in our body is caused due to an unhealthy problem. Now, I'm not going to make this workshop too morbid by talking about all the diseases, but we'll just quickly run through all the diseases that may occur or mostly occur due to an unhealthy colon. So if you look at the diseases on the left, like allergies, flu, nasal congestion, nasal itching, asthma, hay fever, these are caused due to unhealthy colon because if the colon doesn't eliminate waste fully, what happens is the waste gets recirculated back into the bloodstream and the blood ends up circulating it back to the organs. Does that make sense? Right? If the colon doesn't evacuate the waste, the toxins get reabsorbed in the bloodstream and sometimes they get deposited in the face, causing allergies, nasal congestion, flu, asthma, itching, hay fever. All of these are caused due to bronchial disorders, which is triggered due to an unhealthy colon. So next time your child has a lot of bronchial health issues, the first thing you look into is, is the child evacuating waste food? Is the child having a healthy bowel movement? That's a very important and critical factor to maintain good bronchial health. Make sense? <coughs> now look at the issues on the right, depression, chronic fatigue disorders, lack of coordination, lack of concentration, mood swings, and Even these are caused to an unhealthy colon or account. Have you heard of this concept called the gut is a second brain? Yeah. You've heard about it, right? The gut is literally the second brain because it has more neurons in it than it has in the brain, which means it's constantly sensing and feeling things in the gut, right? So when you feel anxious, scared, excited, happy, when you feel it, feel it here first. Yeah. When you feel restless and nervous, you feel it here first. You feel the runs to the bathroom here when you get nervous, yeah. you feel it here. All your feelings are created here. Isn't that amazing? So you should actually listen to a man who says, I love you from the bottom of my cup. <laughs> not from the bottom of my cup. Because that's not where feelings are created. You're lying, right? So the next time a man says, I love you from the bottom of my heart, say, no, you need to go, go deep down into your gut and tell me you love you. Right? Make sense? Yeah. Not just feelings and emotions, even memories are stored here. Could you imagine your memories actually stored in the gut? So if you go to a place where you met with an accident, where you've had a bad, funky experience, you have this gut wrenching feeling, yeah. something's not right, something feels off. You listen to your gut when you make decisions, right? Most of you here have had a public career before moving to India as an expat wife, right? You've had those busy lives. How many times Some have of us are still working. <laughs> so, that yeah. Just because we're here, we don't have busy working lives. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. So <laughs> how do you make your business decisions? Well, with data. And right. analytical data. Right. And sometimes but, with your intuitive skills right. as well. But ultimately, that has to filter through your intuition. Yeah. That's intelligent, right? right? It's amazing how we actually rely on our intuition more than our analytical skills. Analytical skills are very important to get your research and development place, to get your data and numbers in place, right? And if you're sitting in a business meeting and you say, I have a brain feeling the strategy would work. Will people listen to you? Instead, try saying, I have a heart feeling this idea is great. Will people still listen to you? But the minute you say, I have a gut feeling that this is going to be a great idea, you have everybody's attention. And the person, actually the decision maker would go with the person who says, I have a gut feeling, rather than go with the person who says, I think this is a great idea. The person who says, I have a gut feeling this is a great idea, gets selected. 
Have you noticed that? There's a lot of wisdom in the language. When we say gut feeling, gut clenching feeling, gut is the second way. There's a lot of knowledge and wisdom in that. Health knowledge. So this is where memories are stored. This is where emotions are created, this is where feelings are created. And also, this is where 75% of serotonin and dopamine, which is responsible for your happiness, is created. Can you imagine? Happiness is actually created here. So if this is healthy, this is clean, you automatically feel happy. How many of you here have felt absolutely happy after having an amazing moment? You feel like, oh, today is a great day, I'm gonna see the day. Have you felt that? But say if you're constipated, or you have diarrhea, or irritable thoughts, or you feel an uneasiness of discomfort. Don't you feel the whole day is going to be challenging? You feel that. Simply yes. it's like, it's frustrating. It sits you in, it's like, as soon as it's out, you're like, oh, okay, I can go eat a whole meal now. Yeah, when you're like, like, or when you're like drunk, you just turn around and you're like, okay, I can start drinking again. How many of you have left the party because of discomfort yeah. saying, I don't feel good? You feel good as it's sad. I don't feel good, and if I don't feel good here, I can't enjoy a party. You can't. That's, that's that makes sense, right? If you have constipation, diarrhea, gas, irritable bowel syndrome, malnutrition, colon polyps, Crohn's disease, all of these are actually created here. And if you look at the list on the left, it talks about a series of diseases, right? From constipation, diarrhea, gas, up to cancer. They trigger due to an unhealthy colon. See how important colon <coughs> health is becoming now. Most researchers at Harvard, Stanford, Maryland, Georgia universities have put together a lot of intelligent research reports saying that 90% of all diseases can be avoided if we keep the colon and the gut healthy. Leaky gut syndrome, have you heard about it? Leaky gut syndrome happens when the gut is basically your large intestine, small intestine, and colon. So the intestine is where food and nutrition is being absorbed and assimilated, right? Food is digested in the stomach, then it goes into the intestines where you absorb the nutrition from the food. Now the large intestine, small intestine, is probably the longest organ inside the body after the skin. The large intestine is about six feet long and the small intestine is about 22 feet long. Isn't that amazing that it's actually been put together in this tiny space here? This is your small intestine. Excuse my drawing, it's as skittish as it can get, but I hope it delivers the point. This is six feet long and this is 22 feet long. This is where absorption and assimilation of nutrition happens. The macronutrients and the micronutrients. But what's happening with our daily lifestyle, the modern lifestyle, because it's sedentary, we're sitting more than we used to before, right? And because of the foods that we eat, refined food, refined sugar, refined salt, refined oil, refined ghee, refined flour, the pizza paste, uh, it's called maida and hindi, refined flour. What's happening with refined foods is, it comes out of a factory, it doesn't come from the farm to the table, like it does at Saunders Park Cuisine and most of the good restaurants that are organic. Instead of coming from the farm to the table, they go from the farm into a factory where they put it in a machine and crushed way too fine and it becomes refined. It tastes great, but the minute it enters your gut, it starts leaking because it's refined. Does that make sense? Refined foods actually leaking from your gut, causing holes in your gut, and does a leaky gut syndrome. Because your gut is basically cells held tightly together like this in a conjunction. Your gut is not a skin or a bag or an airtight junction. Your gut is the thinnest membrane in the body. Can you imagine? The most important part of our body is actually the thinnest membrane in the body. It's as thin as your hair strand. So if you're going to eat something that's damaging, or that's too rough, or too coarse, or undigested, or a half-chewed food, it is going to create discomfort. Sometimes when we eat wrong fermentations and combinations of food, say you mix milk and yogurt with fruits, it does become gassy in the stomach. Why? Because it's getting contaminated here, and then they start reacting with each other, creating toxins. And these toxins get secreted into the bloodstream. <laughs> Scary? Well, I'm just like, eat fruit and yogurt every yeah. morning. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. we, we'll talk yeah. about some formulations and combinations <laughs> that we're making mistakes of, but this is also because of a fast paced lifestyle, right? Not a like, we're in a rush. We need to quickly eat and get to work. We need to pay our bills. We need to pay rent. We need to pay salaries. We can't be in a uh, make believe happy world where we can just, you know, meditate and go around from a jink. We can't do that. Of course, we're in a busy world. So what we do? We eat everything in a rush. Yeah. We don't even chew yeah. our food yeah. nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. How many of us chew our food 32 times? Yeah. When we were growing and up, we're doing something else yes. while eating. Yeah. Really Looking at the phone, answering messages, That's answering right. emails. Yeah. We should just concentrate on eating. Yeah. Because you know, when you are actually looking at your food and eating, like you look at the cutlery here, they're all made of meat. There's a reason why. Yeah. Look at this. This is made of copper. Yeah. It sterilizes the food. But when you're looking at food and eating, your brain does something magical. 
So when you touch the food, in India we eat food with our hands. I know sometimes it's ridiculed in the West you know, for doing that. But when I eat food with my hands, the fingertips immediately send messages to the brain. What kind of food I'm eating? Is it cold? Is it hot? Is it rough? Is it soft? Does it need more digestion? The brain immediately sends signal to the stomach on what kind of digestive change to make. Make sense? Yeah. And when I take a food, I look at it, I give it 100% attention. Your eye consumes 10 million bits of information per second. We talked about it last time as well. 10 million bits of information. Can you believe how beautiful and magical the eye is? But if I sit and analyze every single information, I'm going to go crazy. So the brain converts the information that you see into perception and tells you that this is what you're eating. But when the eye looks at the food, it sends a lot of critical information to the brain of what kind of food we're eating. And then the brain sends a message to the stomach again saying, the food looks spicy, the food looks hot. It sends messages to the mouth as well. And have you noticed she starts salivating just by the sight of food? But instead if you were blindfolded and someone puts food into your mouth, you have a dry mouth syndrome. You don't really salivate that much. So you start salivating again. And then when you put it in your mouth, you chew it 32 times, you're creating that much saliva in your mouth that helps break down that complex food and aids in digestion when it comes to the stomach. So the digestion should happen once the food is digested, only then you're in a position to absorb the simple nutrients. And then you eliminate the waste. But if any of these activities are not done correctly, the digestion, the absorption and assimilation, the permutations and combinations of food, the time of eating food, then you end up screwing up the last part, which is elimination of waste. And this not being eliminated means everything goes back to the brain, the heart, the lungs, the kidney, the intestines. You see how cyclical this is becoming? lifestyle. We do something wrong in the morning, the whole day goes wrong. Have you experienced that? You trip and fall in the morning, you'll be like, oh my god, I got off the wrong side of the bed. The whole day is going to be crazy. That's the same thing with the body. The first step, which is eating, if that's not done correctly, the whole cycle gets screwed up. Make sense? So this talks about pollen and gut health. And now we're going to talk about Ayurveda, because that's exactly what we want to talk about. And also how we can use Ayurveda now, if you look at Ayurveda, the word itself is two words, Ayu plus Veda, which means knowledge of life. Veda means knowledge. Anyone here who speaks Hindi or has heard Hindi language before? Veda means knowledge and Ayu means life. So Ayurveda is basically knowledge of life, how to live a healthy, happy and a productive life so that you can actually go around pursuing your personal needs, your materialistic needs, your spiritual desires. But you cannot pursue any of these if you don't have a healthy body. Ayurveda basically facilitates a healthy body so you can go about living a good life. That's all it does. So this is not just for India or just for people from Kerala. This is for people around the world. So the French do it, the Americans do it, the Italians do it. You know, they all listen to their uh, age-old wisdom that has been passed on by their parents and grandparents. That is Ayurveda. Like the French like to eat fermented wine and sourdough bread in the winters before a meal because that craves good probiotics and it helps in increasing appetite. Makes sense, right? Yeah. There is wisdom in that. The Polish people like to have aperitifs. They have like this bitter whiskey aperitif. They drink that, which helps in increasing the metabolic fire and the digestive fire, they're able to digest all the food. Make sense? Now Ayurveda talks about five elements. Anyone here knows about the five elements in the body? You know, of course, Kanisha. <laughs> Earth, water, air. Earth, ether. water, air, ether. There's one more. Yes. Ether, ether. Fire. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. That's correct. So there are five elements. Earth, water, fire, air, and space. <coughs> I'm just writing monosyllable letters. Letters you can still understand, right? So Ayurveda says that your body is made of only five elements. Earth, water, fire, air, and space. Chinese medicine also follows the same rule. Greek traditional medicine also follows the same rule. We're not made of anything else astronomical. Everything else beyond this, like your Greek, your uh, pride, your identity, your ego, all of these are man-made. This is the only thing that nature is made of. So if you're made of nature, shouldn't we go to nature for solutions when we have this order in our body? Does that make sense? That we actually eat nature all day long. We're eating food, which is earth and water. The metabolic fire in your body is Water and fire. The air you breathe is air and space. Right? You're made of nature. You're consuming nature 24 7. Can you stop consuming nature just when you go to sleep and say, I'm going to stop consuming nature so no more breathing for me? We can't. 
when earth and water comes together, it becomes a body type called Kapha. These are the three different body types as per Ayurveda. In fact, we've given you a test uh, strip. Uh, Pablo can probably give you guys some pencils. We're giving you a test strip to understand what body type you fall under. Okay? I'm just going to tell you what the three body types are, then we can fill that test form to understand which category you fall in. Right? So what Ayurveda does is, it understands that there are five elements in the body, and if these five elements are in balance, you're in good health. And if any of these elements are out of balance, it causes diseases in that specific region. Okay? Now when earth and water comes together, it becomes kapha. That's a word that you remember for now. When water and fire comes together, it becomes pitta. And air and space, when they come together, it becomes vata. We're just going to talk about these three body types. We're not going to do anything too complex today. Yeah, that's the test. Yeah, it talks about the characteristics. If I can have a copy, I'll just show you everyone. So this is what your form list looks like. We're just going to fill this up to understand what body category we follow. You all have one? Okay, I'm going to quickly tell you to start filling up some of those columns and understand which category you fall under. It's okay if you have multiple symptoms. Like if you feel like your hair is dry as well as dark, as well as bouncy. Yes. yes. And then you can see how many you have in each column. So you can fall in multiple categories. You don't have to, you know, come by, uh, come only under a single category. I'm going to write down some more notes here for that. Was that easier? 
Yeah, it's pretty, yeah, it's interesting, right? How Ayurveda can actually categorize human bodies into three categories. Yeah. So Ayurveda says that there's only three body types, Kapha, Pitta, and Vata. And when you look at a person, you can actually tell which body type they fall under. There's a lot of logic to the science, actually. Yeah. It's a lot of deep understanding of the human body. But you know the problem is in the presentation. Because if it's not That's presented it's well, well, then you always feel stuck in that. We're there to bridge the gap between traditional Ayurvedic science and modern research based Correct. science. Because Ayurveda is 5,000 years old yeah. and modern research based science is a recent thing, right? It's been there for the last 200 years. So how do we bridge the gap between something that's 5,000 years old and intuitive intelligence yeah. and something that's 200 years old but analytical intelligence? Research reports like this can help bridge the gap. I mean, put it down. The thing with Ayurveda is also because it was spoken and practiced in traditional languages, it got lost in translation over the last 300 years. Also, when the British came, they shut down all the Ayurvedic colleges. And Ayurveda was not allowed to be uh, the main healthcare system anymore. They made uh, Western medicine the main healthcare, and Ayurveda was made alternative. Oh, really? After the British left, the colleges have been reopened now. Oh, yeah. So now we started studying Ayurveda again. In fact, Pablo there, uh, who you've met, so you yeah, know, he's 16 Pablo's years old. He's come from Mexico. Oh. We have students from 18 countries and interns from four countries, from Keretaro. We've had about three students already. They spent two months with us, three months studying Ayurveda. Yeah, but at 16, he's just 16. Wow. His friends were all 16 when they studied Ayurveda with us. We have in Mexico, also a big hub for a lot of things. Brazil, Brazil Mexico, 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 all of these Indian culture, I think. They're more closer to nature. You see, yeah. they have less diseases than people who are not close to nature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like the Americans, I think, As against living in a brick and mortar house, yeah. if you live close to nature, where there are trees and squirrels yeah. and birds, you're always healthy. That's right. That's why right. Bombay is very unhealthy. We've had patients from 43 countries, actually. We've had patients so, from Japan, <coughs> China, Korea, Australia, Brazil, France, Nicaragua, El Salvador. Countries that I've not heard of before, San Miguel, 43 countries so far. We've had students from 18, 18 countries. So students that can watch your they training center, yes. so one can study with yes. you? Yes. We yes. teach Ayurveda for seven days. We can teach you nutrition and diet. We can tell you how to eat for your body type. Yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, we've given out these pamphlets here. Because, you know, whatever I can cram into one hour, I will. Uh, I don't want to like give in too much information also because I want to ease you into the whole concept of Ayurveda as a daily lifestyle method. Mm -hmm. It's not something that you go to when all methods are failed and you're too sick. It's not something that you go to when you're sick. It's something that you practice in a daily life. That's what Ayurveda is. Ayurveda follows the circadian rhythm of the sun. Most of you have read about the circadian rhythm, right? Yeah. Eat when the sun rises, stop eating when the sun sets. So this is what Ayurveda is for. And the seven day course here, we're going to teach you some vegan recipes, vegetarian recipes, the philosophy of Ayurveda, the introduction to Ayurveda, the concepts like five elements, three body types, uh, the different nutrition for different body types. So you can't eat the food that she eats and she can't eat the food that you eat, which doesn't mean you can't share a meal. There are some vegetables that are suitable for her that won't be suitable for you because your digestive fire is different from hers. There are four types of fire, in fact, inside the stomach. Uh, you heard of Agni, the word Agni? In Hindi, it's called Agni. In English, it's called the metabolic fire. There are actually four different kinds of metabolic fire. Not all people have the same metabolism. There's one called balanced metabolism. So your body heat goes up during winter and your body heat goes down during summer. And there's something called irregular metabolism. It just does whatever it feels like and you're always sick because of that. It has a mind of its own. Also because of constant interferences from modern gadgets, your body doesn't listen to itself. And there's something called hypermetabolism. There's something called hypometabolism. These can be triggered due to thyroid as well. So even metabolism has four different types. And this has been identified by Ayurveda 5,000 years ago. Even these concepts, like, you know, there are only five elements. These were identified 5,000 years ago, even before we knew there's something called space and ether. Even before we, you know, announced to the world that the world is round. We were under the concept that the world is flat. We're going to fall off the edge. Right? But then, even then, Ayurveda knew that the world is circular. Everything that goes around comes around. That's why the language, because the earth is round. Yeah? Okay, so you guys have done the test. Shall I break it down for you and help you understand which body category you fall under? So we said there are three body types, right? Kapha, Pitta, and Vata. Right? Now, where does Kapha belong? Kapha is generally predominant between the age of 0 to 14. It doesn't matter if you have those categories. Pitta is predominant between 14 to 40. And 
vata is predominant from 40 and upwards. Predominant, that's not your body type. So your body type, whether you're a kapha, pitta, or vata, is determined at the time of conceiving based on the health of the egg, the sperm, the health of the uterus, and the kind of the diet your mother followed during her pregnancy. So your body type is determined at the time of birth itself. It's like a zodiac sign, it doesn't change. Your birthday doesn't change, right? No matter how old you grow. I'm 40 years old today, so my birthday changes. It doesn't happen. Your birthday in your zodiac sign doesn't change. Similarly, your body type doesn't change from birth to end. So once you know what body character you fall under, you can actually eat a list of vegetables, fruits, spices, nuts, dairy products that are suitable for that body type. And you can avoid eating vegetables and fruits that are not suitable for that body type. This is something that we do with the clinic. It's called Ayurvedic diet chart. Once we know what your pulse is, what body type you are, we give you a diet chart that tells you that this is your sustainable diet chart for the rest of your life. The foods that are uh, put under the category limit or avoid, those are foods that you can eat in the afternoon when the sun is high, when your metabolic fire is high. Otherwise, you don't eat those foods. You limit those foods when you're sick. Does that make sense? Yeah? So we'll talk about the three body types. Uh, and we'll also talk about <coughs> where in the body is it predominant. When we're born, kapha becomes predominant between the age of 0 to 14 because kapha is responsible for creating bones, teeth, nails, and hair. Kapha is responsible for stability in the body. That's the key word for kapha. So that's why kids between 0 to 14 are growing and eat more sweets because they're building bones, tissues, muscles, nails, and hair. Without kapha, we're like an amoeba without a body form. Make sense? So kapha is also predominant in this region, in the chest and the head region. So say if someone is having kapha imbalances, they will have imbalances in this region. They'll have allergies, flu, cold, nasal congestion, asthma, hay fever, bronchial disorders, allergies. You see children between 0 to 14 have more issues in this region always. Mm -hmm. They go to school and they always come back home with a cold or a cough or an allergy and you'll be like, where the hell do you get it from? The house is clean, the food is clean, you're taking good care of them, you're putting them to sleep on time, you're losing sleep trying to take care of them, but they still come back home with an allergy for school. Because they're very sensitive in this region. That's kapha body type. <coughs> this is make sense, kapha body type. The second is pitta body type. This is predominant between the age of 14 to 40 because this is responsible for transformation in the body. It converts what you eat into calories and energy. It converts what you see into perception. It is a metabolic fire inside your stomach. So say if this is excess in your body, the metabolic fire, it will cause imbalances in this region, the chest and the stomach region, it can cause heartburn, esophageal reflux, acid reflux, burning sensation, indigestion, bloating. This is pretty common, right? Have you noticed children, uh, teenagers between the age of 14 to 18 and 20, tend to have more issues here in the stomach? They'd be like, I'm having a tummy ache because they ate too much junk or oily food or spicy food. They already have a high metabolic fire, and then if they eat oily and spicy food, the metabolic fire starts enraging, causing burning sensation, indigestion, bloating, tummy aches. It's not having more issues in this region. The third body type is vata, which is made of air and space. That's predominant from the age of 40 and upwards. This is responsible for movement in the body. This helps in blood circulation, it helps in lungs contracting and expanding. It also helps in moving calories from the stomach and the intestine to different body organs so they can get the energy. This is responsible for movement, also the movement in your brain. The ideas that are circulating comes from vata. But if this goes out of balance, it is predominant in this region. You start having bloating, gas, flatulence. You start having issues in the small and large intestine, constipation, diarrhea, irritable bowel syndrome. And it also causes joint disorders and musculoskeletal pain, like arthritis, osteoporosis, rheumatism, spondylosis. These diseases happen when there's too much air and space in the body. Acid reflux happens when there's too much fire and water in the body. Obesity happens when there's too much earth and water in the body. Make sense? Very logical, right? Every disease can be attributed to an imbalance in an element. This is literally what Ayurveda talks about. So if you look at your body types, what do you think you fall into? Which character do you fall into? We'll just analyze. Like what was your body type? Mine, I think Kapha. Kapha? So there's a, another intelligent thing about body types. Kapha is responsible for stability and bones, right? So Kapha people will have the thickest bone structure by default because you have built stronger bones during your childhood and you always have a thicker body frame. So Kapha people tend to put on weight fast but struggle to lose weight. They tend to love sweet food. Not so much. That's good. Yeah, really like, yeah, it's good if you don't like sweet food. 
So kappa people, because they're high on earth and water, they have too much moisture in the body, they tend to have water retention very quickly or bloating. We give them rough food to reduce water retention from the system. That aids in weight loss. Anybody else out here who felt they were in the kappa category? Kappa category? Yeah? So you see the characteristics, it's very easy to categorize. Anybody else who felt they were kappa category? Kappa? But the beauty about kappa, even though it causes a big bone structure, Kappa people have more stability in their mental make and their emotional make as well as their physical make. Kappa is responsible for feelings like compassion, empathy, and kindness. That's why you see children between the age of 0 to 14, they're always compassionate and kind to everybody and anybody. They don't know what racism is. They don't know what you know poor and rich is. They're kind to everybody, be it a plant or an animal or an ant or you know your maid or your chef's yeah. children. They're always kind. Kappa is responsible for that. It creates stability in the mind, in the heart, and in the physical body. And they have a thicker bone structure. But they will also have a tendency towards a certain kind of diseases, like, uh, I would say diseases, disorder and imbalances, like weight gain. They may also have a sluggish colon sometimes. They do not eliminate waste that quickly. They have thick hair and oily skin. But they also may have uh, a tendency of avoiding or withdrawing from the society on weekends and wanting to just relax on the couch eat your pizza and watch TV. That's their idea of chilling out? Sometimes. Okay? Now, it doesn't it, it doesn't mean you belong in this box. You can be in multiple boxes. Anybody here who felt they were flexible? Anybody here who felt they were pitta? Okay. So pitta people will generally have isolation, esophageal class, heartburn, acid class. You feel that? Isn't it interesting that even before you've told us what your symptoms are, we can tell you by just looking at you and your body type and your pulse. We can tell you that do you have issues in this region? Now, Pitta people, if it is balanced, they are the go getters. They can convert any idea into a project because they're capable of transformation. They go getters, literally. But if Pitta goes out of balance, even though it creates ambition, when it's out of balance, it can create hunger pangs, aggression, irritability, short temper. Because the fire is too much, it's, it's burning inside of you. It's going to irritate you. But how people should, in fact, eat a meal every two hours to keep the fire happy. If you skip a meal, have you noticed you get irritable and angry and you're like, oh my god, I'm having hunger back, don't talk to me. Couple of people can go for hours together without eating because they have enough to burn. Right? Intermittent fasting is good for couple of people up to 16 hours. You can do up to 16 hours without damaging your body. But some people cannot do more than 12 hours of eating. So if you ate dinner at 8, you better start eating breakfast at 8 because the fire inside of you is so strong, it's going to burn your system. Make sense? Yeah. Very logical, right? Nothing is like voodoo or witchcraft or alchemist kind of birthing. The concept that we have of Ayurvedas is an alchemy. It's not. It's very logical science based on the elements of nature. So how many people here about Pitta? You could relate to the symptoms that you tend to have more issues here. Yeah? Now, imbalances in any of these doshas will cause imbalance here as well. Your mental health and your emotional health will get affected. Any of the elements are out of balance. All of these can be to mental health. How many of you have felt they were marked out? Predominantly marked out. You were predominantly marked out. First side of the Anybody else who felt they were marked out? Yes, you're marked out. I know this lad in the morning. Marked out? Anybody else? Okay, Vata people have the thinnest bone structure. They never put on weight. <laughs> they never put on weight and they make us feel sick about our weight. No, I don't well, you're not a Pitta. I'm Pitta, I'm usually Pitta and Vata. So Pitta people tend to put on weight quickly and lose weight also very quickly. Within a few workouts, they'll be like, oh my god. And I've noticed like, you know, I'm usually Pitta body type. So say if I go running for two weeks, I'm not kidding you. Everybody comes up to me and says, you can weight. Because Pitta is water and fire. The minute I start running, exercising, I lose a lot of water from my body. And my metabolic fire starts enraging, burning all the fat. Pitta people tend to put on weight fast and lose weight fast. And sometimes they have a tendency of going extremes, which is not good. Okay? If you go extremes, then you need to get a check. Sometimes they can go overboard with the exercise and workouts, going to crossfit and doing aggressive workouts. Then they start having pimples and boils in the face. Have you noticed? Yeah. People who work out a lot have pimples because the fire has started engaging and burning through the skin. Like, yes, I do. So sometimes when I go to CrossFit excessively, the first thing I notice is pimples and boils in the face. My fire is enough to sustain my life. I don't have to overdo it. We tend to get very competitive in this region. So, oh, she's lifting 30, I'm going to do 35. But your body doesn't need it. Kappa people 
should work out more. This time people should work out moderately. Vata people, because of air and space, should do more yoga, meditation, and mind workouts. Heavy workouts is only for this body. So even workouts can be broken down as a body class. That's good. That's good because you're strengthening your core. And you're doing yoga. There's so many people it can to an extent I'll tell you and maybe they should include so what you can't do with exercise you can correct with diet have you heard ah. the 95 5 rule no so most people in the gym may not tell you this but the good trainers will tell you this 95% of your health comes from the food you eat only 5% of your health comes from the workout I thought an 80 20 80 20 80 20 but if you read further research, they actually put it down into 95.5. Have you seen monks and sages? They don't exercise at all, but they're always skinny. Okay, hey, but listen, there was, a, there was a documentary that all the monks are also getting obese. That's because, because of greed. Disorder. Okay. That's, no, that's, that's because disorder. of greed. That's because of greed. Yes. Uh, so the true monks and sages. Yeah, yeah, if you come across a real monks and sages, yeah, they live in Himalayas. Yeah. They do not interact with yeah. society. Oh, those so the ones that are in the society, they don't yeah. exercise. Yeah. Yeah. They don't interact with the ones that are in the society tend to become greedy, yeah. tend to start eating more, collecting more money, collecting more followers, trying yeah. to be more disillusioned people. Those are the people you should always keep away from. Keep away from a fat monk. <laughs> <laughs> keep away from a thin monk and a fat monk. <laughs> never trust a skinny chef. Have you heard never trust a skinny chef? If the chef is skinny, never trust, they say that. Yeah, that's right. Right. Because it's true to the profession, a chef who cooks good food will put on weight. That's what I would say. But a monk who's talking about giving up things in life but is looking massive, <laughs> dude, what are you giving up to look like that? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm categorizing things, but I, if I see a fat monk, except for happy Buddha, laughing Buddha, because Buddha laughs, Buddha enjoys everything, enjoys food, enjoys water, enjoys life, I trust laughing Buddha. But a monk who talks about, you know, celibacy and stuff like that, but still looks big, yeah. I'd be like, okay, I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> Make sense? Have yeah. you seen like people like Sadhguru and most of these guys yeah. who do a lot of yoga meditation? Even if they don't work out, they tend to be skinny. Uh -huh. But because of the lifestyle that they're sitting yeah. and constantly giving sermons, they tend to put on a little weight. Mm. It's a bit unfortunate because modern lifestyle makes them like that. Okay? So anyways, moving back to the last part. Vata, how many people felt about Vata? There were two. They are the thinnest bone structure. They do not put on weight quickly. They're made of air and space. Um, one question. So you said you could be... Multiple body types. There are seven body types actually, that's a good question. So there's Kappa, Pitta, Vata. You can also be Kappa, Pitta, Kappa, Vata, Pitta, Vata. And you can also be all three. I have a lot of Pitta. You do? Most. You do? Then also, Pitta people have sharp eyes and sharp features. So you have Pitta and Vata, they have dark hair as well. So you come in a Pitta and... I have sharp eyes, but they just don't work that well. My eyesight's really bad. No, sharp penetrating eyes. You're like, your eyes look beautiful and like, yeah, but they just don't work very well. No, no, that's <laughs> the problem. <laughs> yeah. Their appearance over there, sharp appearance and penetrating. The outside. <laughs> they have beautiful sharp eyes. <laughs> Vata people may have a tendency of having dry, rough skin, even though they're skinny. The skin becomes very dry, the hair becomes very rough very quickly because they're air and space. They don't have moisture in the body. And they also have less earth. So what should Vata people do? Because they're air and space, they should have more solid foods, warm foods to balance the body. They should have more warm foods and mighty spicy foods and sweet foods to balance the body. Pitta people, because they're excessive on fire and water, should have more sweet foods to balance the fire. This is very basic that I'm giving you, but the diet chart that we do generally goes up to four pages. You know, we break down every single vegetable, every single millet and grain that you have in your diet. You can ask me questions like, can I have paneer? I'll tell you, paneer is good for which body type and not good for which. There are some elements that are good for all body types, and he's good for all. Oil is good for vata, not so good for pitta because they're high on fire. You don't put oil in a fire, oily food. Oily food, we also say less for other people because they have a tendency of storing it. Right? So oil, ghee, salt, sugar, millets, grains, pulses, vegetables, foods. We'll tell you which body types should have, which vegetable and food you should have. Like juicy foods are really good for water because it helps in creating moisture for them. Juicy foods are good for pitta as well. And for kapha, we give less foods and more salty vegetables instead. Because foods are sugar-based and vegetables are salty. So we give them more vegetables, salty vegetables, to help in reducing water retention. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's very logical, right? Can you speak a little bit to non-vegetarian? Yes. So do you just assume everyone should be vegetarian? No, no, no. Or do you, okay. So what we do is, this is this is a diagram that I was going to show you. 
So when you wake up in the morning, at 6 in the morning, assuming that the sun rises at 6 a.m. and sets at 6 p.m., we'll just take a very categorical thing in India. When you're waking up, your metabolic fire is only this high. So do not eat meat in the morning for sure. What do you eat in the morning? You can have fluids first. You drink some water to first irrigate the system. Then you have fruits because that's active prebiotic probiotic system. It has active microbes and bacteria to enhance your gut flora. And then when you're here at around 8 or 9 in the morning, you have cooked breakfast. Always start your day with fluids, then fruits, then have a small cooked breakfast. So what do you eat for breakfast? You can't have beef or pork. Yeah. What do you eat for breakfast? Eggs is okay. Eggs. But even better, if you have like cereals and muesli yeah, oats. and oats. And you know in India we have idli and dosa because those are good bacteria. You can have like uh, crepes in France for breakfast. You can have that. You can have uh, uh, millets. Like you can have porridge, khichdi, dalia. You can have porridge in the morning. <laughs> porridge is easier in the morning. But other Western diets always, I mean I noticed that they have fruits, yogurt and nuts. Is that not a good combination? So ideally we say fruit shouldn't be mixed with anything, yeah. including milk, yogurt, vegetables, nuts, spices, and uh, pulses and grains. Reason being, fruits react with everything and anything that is mixed with. So if you mix milk and grapes together, it can cause instant poisoning in the body. It can cause instant skin disorders, like psoriasis. Grapes and milk is a very dangerous combination. It can cause instant death in children. Grapes and milk or grapes and yogurt? Grapes and milk. I would say avoid yogurt as well. No dairy with the grapes. Never mix dairy products with grapes. Unless it's raisins. Because it has been really dehydrated. Never mix citric fruit with milk. Have you noticed? Yeah. Yeah. Never mix milk. Yeah. So citric fruits is more active. But your other fruits like apple and banana, they look harmless. But they constantly react with the air. Have you noticed it comes apple? It yeah. 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 The same when you put apple with milk, it starts reacting with the milk. Fruits have a nature that they react with anything and everything that they are mixed with. But oats comes with We have a tendency to make life easy. You put fruits and oats and milk together and eat it. It's best not to do that. Because whatever you eat breaks down into two. Nutrition and toxin. Nutrition is what your body absorbs. Toxin is what your body eliminates. But if your body doesn't eliminate fully, you end up resurfacing that toxin. Everything you eat creates both. Because there's preservatives in food, pesticides in food. Even organic food has a little preservative and shelf life. So they will create a little toxin as well when they get digested. And you're supposed to eliminate the toxin. So I will answer your question because of the meat. You had a question too? Yes. Uh, what about flavored yogurts? Because you get those strawberry yogurts, yeah. mango yogurts. Yeah, so they are generally flavored with dehydrated strawberries. They don't use fresh strawberries. And what about uh, people like to drink like yak yogurt and bite it in because they have uh, probiotics in them for the stomach? I'll come to that. I'll come to that. I'll answer all the questions first. I'll take all the questions in a go. I'll answer hers okay. first. And Sorry. Yeah. Yes, you're not good. Okay. It's good. I'm, I'm happy that you're enthusiastic and interested. Yeah. You know, smoothies have become a fad. I'm sorry. I'm breaking this. Smoothies have become a fad because it's an easy life. Yeah. You just put everything in a mixer, churn it, and then eat it. It makes them happy. Instead, if you give them raw fruits in the morning, they're chewing, they're exercising the facial muscles, you're reducing the risk of facial palsy and paralysis, Parkinson and Alzheimer's because you're exercising your face and stimulating your pituitary gland and circulating blood to the brain. It actually improves their IQ and EQ level when you make them chew to that. It's still the same. Yeah. Smoothies are not a good culture, I'm sorry to say, because I have seen very toxic combinations being made by people where they mix vegetables and fruits together in smoothies. I'll tell you the math for it. After finishing this, I'll give you the math of fruits and vegetables. So you know which ones to mix. So coming to your question, we start with a light meal in the morning. Between 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., you see how high the metabolic fire is? You eat anything you want here. This is where you eat all your heavy foods and your familiar foods, your junk, your pizzas, your burgers. When? 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. It varies from country to country. I'm saying it for India right now because I know the sun is at the peak at 12 in the afternoon. Yeah. But of course, in a Scandinavian country, maybe the sun rises at 11 or 12 in the afternoon sometimes. And it goes yeah. down at 2. <laughs> yeah, so then the peak <laughs> is in the winter. Yeah. Like two hours of sunlight, so the peak is probably 6 in the evening for them. Yeah. Go to the peak. Try to draw this diagram with the sunrise and the sunset. It changes from country to country. 
So I put 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. just for India because yeah. you guys are all in India right now. You can follow this rule. Every country is going to draw the circadian rhythm. Follow the rhythm of the sun because your metabolic fire is directly corresponding to the position of the sun. Makes sense, right? Technically, you're eating what the sun grows on the planet. Plants and animals couldn't grow without the sun. And you're eating what is a direct contribution of the sun. So you follow the rule of the sun. No matter which country you're in. In fact, in India, most people wake up and pray to the sun. Yeah. It's, it's a ritual. We pray to the sun. You know, we eat a little mint leaf because it boosts our immunity. We drink a little water from the prayer. So these are rituals. This is not religious. These are health rituals, actually. Even with you, we start Yeah. But we've started making it like a religious cult now, you know, like praying yeah. to see. It's actually a health ritual. Drinking water, opening the yes. they put the prayer in just so that you have to stabilize that. the mind. Uh, yeah. So it's like you know, how do you stabilize the mind? You keep saying one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. It shuts the monkey down. It stabilizes the mind. That's why we keep chanting in India because it calms the mind down. It prevents your mind from thinking excessively because you're so busy counting complex numbers and complex words that your mind doesn't have the time to think that. Make sense? If I keep chanting. I get so busy chanting that I stop worrying about trivial things in my life. That's the ritual. It doesn't have to be religious. Religion, unfortunately, has become a political statement in India. So I would refrain from, you know, any kind of religious uh, advice. Yeah, you don't have to follow this specific category. So you eat everything you want out here between 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And then you start slowing down. Four in the afternoon, you can eat fruits again because the metabolic fire is living. And you eat your large or your last meal at sunset. After sunset, we usually refrain from eating solid food because there's no metabolic fire in the stomach and the digestive juices have also stopped being prepared. So after sunset, ideally we go and have a well-cooked bowl of soup, some steamed salads. Yeah? And again, with salads, I know most of us here love salads. I mean, I love a good salad. But when you're in a tropical country like India, refrain from eating raw salads because there are more pro uh, uh, there are more parasites and bacteria in the salad because it has passed many hands. And this is a tropical country. The population of human is so high. You can imagine the parasite population and the bacteria population will also be high. Because this climate is conducive to population. In frozen countries like Antarctica and Aldex, the population level is low of humans. And even the parasite and bacteria population is low. Animal population is low. Plant population is low. In tropical countries like Brazil and Amazon and India and Asian countries which are in the equator, they tend to have more uh, human population, more parasites, more bacteria, more plants, more animals. You see the variety here is more with plants also and minerals and grains as well. So try to eat cooked salads or steamed salads, cooked food, cooked uh, grains and pulses, and food should be consumed raw instead of juicing it. You'll be exercising your children's mind as well. So you can take smoothies. That's the reason why. So this answers your question on when you can eat food that is so heavy. Eat it in the morning, afternoons. Avoid eating it at night. Have you noticed that when you eat a pizza at 10 in the night, you wake up with a tummy ache next day? Because there's no metabolic fire, the food starts rotting because it's lying in the stomach and it starts digestion next morning, 6 a.m. So avoid junk food here. We should eat junk food once in a while. I never talk to a balance in life. Satiating all your desires. Eat it up. If you eat a pizza in the afternoon, you'll be perfectly fine. Yes. Wine. So wine is had after sunset in countries like France where you know the number of hours of the sun is very less. So you need to drink wine because it's warm and it's active bacteria that's fermented. It creates appetite and it creates a metabolic fire artificially. So wine is good for kappa people. Pitta people it might cause burning sensation. Have you noticed some people can't do red wine? Mm -hmm. Pitta people can't do red wine. I tried red wine once in a while and it burns like crazy and I'm like, okay, wine doesn't like me anymore. Vata people, we generally give them heavier foods. Yeah? So it depends from body to body. You had a question, I'm sorry, I forgot that. Yogurt and fruits. Flavored yogurt. Flavored yogurt? Yeah, and uh, drinks like vitamin and junk food. Okay, so I'm going to draw one more chart here. This will be the last chart so that you know we can be. Uh, can, I, can I have the uh, eraser for the board? Okay, um, okay I'm going to try and draw it here. Can you guys see? These look like the camera. Yeah, 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 just like this. It's okay, let it be. Okay, look at this. I'm going to tell you the digestion capacity of each thing that we drink and eat. Milk and water, if I give you six cups of water to drink right now, in how much time will you go to the bathroom? 
Yes. If you have water or milk, in 30 to 60 minutes you'll be running to the bathroom. Yeah. Makes sense, right? 30 to 60 minutes? Because right from the time you digest it, absorb and assimilate the nutrition, you're ready for elimination in 30 to 60 minutes. Fruits, if you have, do you know how long it takes for it to complete the cycle of digestion, absorption, and elimination? No. Three hours. It's interesting. I'll tell you how. It's a very interesting math, and it's proven science. One hour in the stomach for digestion, fruits need. So when you eat fruits within one hour, you get hungry. Have you noticed? Yeah, yeah. Because the fruit has moved from the stomach into the large intestine, and it's ready for the next meal. It spends one hour in the stomach, one hour in the large intestine, and one hour in the small intestine. And then it moves to the colon and it gets ready for elimination next day. But it, or the same day, if you eat only fruits all day, have you noticed you have a bubble movement the same day? If you eat only fruits and milk and water for the whole day, fasting, some people do food yeah. fast, you end up having bubble movements the same day. So fruits actually need only three hours in the stomach. That's why a lot of sages and monks stick to a meal of just fruits and water because it allows them to pursue your spiritual pursuit. I'll finish this math and you had a question? Yes, I missed when you drew that uh, diagram in the stomach. So after the stomach is the large intestine? Yes, so this is the stomach, large intestine, small intestine. The large intestine is six feet long. The small intestine is 22 feet long. Doesn't so that's- the, Doesn't the small intestine come before the large intestine? No, the, the diagram, the, yes, yes. The macro, the micronutrients, the diagram is like this. So I've just explained oh, okay. it for diagram C without getting too scientific about it. Yeah? Just for ease of understanding. This is where digestion happens. This is where absorption and assimilation of nutrients happens, the macro and the micronutrients. This is where elimination of waste happens. So there are three activities in the cycle that we're talking about. So fruits takes three hours. One on the stomach, one on the large intestine, one on the small intestine. Or vice versa. You can say it other way now. Make sense? Vegetables, how long does it take? This will explain why we don't mix fruits and vegetables and fruits and pulses and goodies. Because different digestive meat. Vegetables, any guess? Six hours. Someone said six? That's correct. It takes six hours. It needs two hours in the stomach. It needs two hours to stay in the stomach so that it can get digested. But what happens sometimes we eat a salad? and say immediately we eat something else and then the vegetable gets pushed down, undigested. So ideally if you eat salads, it should stay in the stomach for two hours, eat your next meal after two hours. It needs two hours in the large and two hours in the small intestine. Six hours. Grains and pulses are complex, correct? Grains and pulses, if they're not soaked, it's best to soak grains and pulses, like dals and millets and all. They take 18 hours in the system. Six hours in the stomach, six in the large intestine, six in the small intestine, to get fully absorbed. But what's happening nowadays is we have one meal and within two to three hours we have another meal. So that undigested food is getting pushed into the intestines. The food hasn't been fully absorbed, the nutrition. The unabsorbed nutrition has started going to the colon and we're sometimes eliminating nutrition from our body. But for a good bowel movement, you should ideally keep the food in the stomach for that many hours and then in the intestines for that many hours. So it gets time to absorb the nutrition because it's a very complex system and a very fragile system. Do you think my salads always have like pulses and, and grains? Like I have chickpeas and yeah. There's and a reason why we do that. And quinoa. So, yeah. what, so how does so that? So if, if I eat, that's fine. That's fine actually. I'll yeah. tell you why. Because then, like, especially for you know, he doesn't want to have like chicken with his salad every day. He, he likes pulses and stuff. There's a reason and why we create that. that. I'll come to that. And I'll, I'll in fact answer your question as well. It's interlinked, the flavor of the salad. Pulses and grains, if I eat only pulses and grains, it's very difficult for me to push it down. It causes a lot of dryness and roughness, right? That's why we add fiber to the pulses and grains. Like if you have a kitchen or a biryani, we add a lot of vegetables to it. Because vegetables have fiber that helps in moving the pulses and grains around. This is 28 feet, literally, approximately, I'm saying, of the intestines, right? We need to be able to move the food around smoothly so it can get absorbed in the skin. That's why we add rubbish in the form of vegetables to pulses and grains. But don't add fruits to pulses and grains. Does this make sense now? But the seeds. The seeds can be added to fruits. Seeds can be added to fruits. What about to the salad? And even to your salads? Yes. yes. Because seeds are dehydrated. They technically need this many hours to get fully absorbed. So some people who have low absorption uh, capabilities, we pre-soak the seeds. Chia, flax, and pumpkin seeds, it's better to pre-soak, especially vata people, yeah. because they have a lot of dryness in the body. It's good to soak all your seeds and your prunes and your uh, 
raisins and almonds, soak them so there's moisture. And then eat it, otherwise it'll cause more dryness in your body. And more dryness means more issues here. More pain, muscular skeletal disorders. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah? I could probably run you through this at the end of this, because I know you missed the starting part, right? Yeah? I'll explain it to you again after when we get to lunch. Uh, so, you understood vegetables and grains? Non-veg, meat, is even more complex. So, ideally, for full absorption, it needs 72 hours in the system. 24 in the stomach, 24 in the last 24 in the small intestine. You don't get hungry when you eat meat. Have you yeah, put hours together? That's the reason why, because the stomach needs that much time to break down the complex protein. Now, this is complex protein. The easiest source of protein is, of course, vegetables, because goats, sheep, cows get their source of protein from plants. We get digested protein from goats, cows, in the form of milk. Milk also has some amount of protein. Paneer has protein. So people who go vegan, they can go from paneer to soya and tofu, though we don't advise soya much because it doesn't have a digestive enzyme in it. Yeah? Now, prebiotics and probiotics. A better replacement is eating a raw fruit here at 8 in the morning before your breakfast and here at 4 p.m. in the evening. These two are very critical hours because your metabolic fire is rising and your metabolic fire is falling. So how do you keep the metabolic fire and the digestive enzymes intact? Is by eating raw foods. Whenever you feel your appetite is falling, eat and wait for half an hour. Your appetite will come back. So for kids, I always advise having these. Yogurt is a good form of probiotic too. They can eat yogurt. But just to make it fun for them, people have started putting strawberry flavor and all that. It's just for fun. It doesn't have any nutritional value. While they're kids, you have to give them something. like It's like a bait. You have to tempt them to have yogurt by putting a little strawberry in it. For now, it's okay, but eventually, stop mixing fruits with yogurt and milk because they're toxic in nature. They create little, little toxins, which you will not notice now, but a few years from now, some organ might end up collecting and absorbing all that toxin. <coughs> Kidney stones, gallbladder stones, um, you know, uh, organ damage usually happens due to toxins being collected in the body and not being eliminated. Now that we know it is toxic in nature, even if it's two percent toxic in nature, why do you want to do it? That's the whole idea. So check out the shelf life. That's another thing. Just like how this stays in the body for 72 hours, it doesn't get eliminated fully for three days. Shelf life food, if say I eat something that has a shelf life of six months, it has the capability to stay in my system also for six months. There's preservative in it, which will allow it to sustain in the body for six months. So try to go less on packaged food and ingredients sold in shops. Yogurt and stuff like that can be made at home. Paneer can be made at home. Yogurt can be made at home. Back in the day, we used to make our own yogurt. We used to get our own fruit. Prebiotic, a bacteria from the previous day or from a neighbor and churn our own milk and make a little yogurt. Trust me, it tastes better and it's easier to digest. You're indirectly consuming a lot of preservatives. Yeah? Bananas are no. So it, for you, for you, it depends. So kappa people, we don't give bananas because they have a tendency of being on weight. Pitta people, we give them less bananas because bananas are heaty in nature. Vata people should eat bananas because it's greasy, it's uh, slimy, it helps in having a smooth quality. So the thing with most nutritionists nowadays, what we do is we take them into protein, carbs, and fat, and we do one size fits all, which is wrong. Yeah. So banana is not good for you, maybe, well, actually, but it's good for another person. Somebody else was more of a cut, uh, See, so it was not good for her, but then she ended up projecting what's not good for her onto yeah. you. But you two are not the same body type. she had a list of fruits that were that were that were gentle and the sugar. So no food is bad. No food. <coughs> there are some fruits that are good for this, and there are some fruits that are bad for this. You have to understand your body type. One size doesn't fit all. We can't wear the same pair of shoes, right? But there's this one doctor who's a endocrinologist, and she said, you know, okay, that fruits can be mixed with vegetables. She said, no, you can't. It's a misnomer out there. So, no, this, I don't know, the nutritionists and the doctors themselves are confused. No, 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 no. So, understand where they're studying from. They're studying from research based science, right? Research is work in progress. Earth was flat before, now Earth is round. Make sense? Paracetamol was good at one point in time. Now they're saying, be careful how much paracetamol they have in my effective disease. Research is working for us. It's not an ultimate sentence. It is constantly progressive. Earlier, they came up with a lot of painkillers. They said painkillers is good. Like 50 years ago, all of us were popping painkillers. I wasn't born then, but the painkillers were okay then. 
Now they like go easy to pay because it may affect your kidney and your gallbladder because it causes stones. Research is work in progress. Nature is not work in progress. Nature was already existent before you and I were born. So what we can question is our own intelligence, but not the way nature works. This is how nature has worked for millions of years. This doesn't change. Which is why we don't mix foods with milk. It may not create poison right now, but it will become toxic in the body and the result will be visible after a few months of years when we start having organ health issues with organ health. So again, don't go with one size fits all because we may end up hurting ourselves or our own family members and kids. It is good. There's a reason for it. In Ayurveda, we talk about six tastes sweet, bitter, salty, astringent, pungent, and sour. We say that all six tastes should be incorporated in our meal. In India, we have a lot of bitter gar and spinach. Yes, uh, bitter and taste, they help in deworming the tissues and cleansing the body. In Europe, because you don't have access to bitter gar and spinach and bitter vegetables, you need to have coffee in your diet because it helps in cleansing the body. Coffee is bitter. Coffee has a bitter flavor. It actually helps in cleansing the body. But I would advise you never to have coffee empty stomach because you're burning your stomach towards <laughs> and burning it. Yeah. So you know what? Have a little cookie. Have a little cookie at least. Even a small piece of cookie. Start chewing it. Or even five almonds and nuts. Or even a walnut. Put it in your mouth. Start chewing those almonds and nuts because it starts creating saliva, which will also help in cooling the stomach. Don't put coffee straight into your stomach. At least have a cup of herbal tea or warm water or lemon water or honey and ginger and pepper. Any of those concoctions to cool the stomach down. And what if you're having your coffee with, with milk? Does that count? Uh, the best way to add milk to your coffee and teas. In India, we have too much of this chai. You guys like yeah, chai? It tastes delicious. But go easy on it because it can be acidic in nature. The reason being, milk is not a vegetable that should be cooked. Tea leaves can be cooked. So cook your black tea and your black coffee. Take it off the gas, off the oven, filter it, and then add a few spoons of milk directly to it in the glass. Don't, don't put the do milk. It. Don't, don't do it. Yeah? Because milk changes nature. It's supposed to be basic, but if you're going to cook it with spices and herbs and teas, so yeah. it become acidic in nature. That's Some people have happens. acid reflux when they have too much chai. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah? Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Don't cook your milk. Boil it separately yeah, and add a few teaspoons. So caffeine with milk is fine. <laughs> but have a piece of cookie of at least five almonds or you know, because since you said your kapha body type, nuts is really good. They're the storehouse of proteins. Have few almonds, raisins, walnuts. Chew, chew, chew while your coffee is getting brewed. Uh, sorry, Jennifer. So, what about the pre soaking of the nuts? Like a lot of Indian households do that. That's for vata. Only vata. Anybody, anybody who's vata body type should always pre soak their nuts because they're too high on air and space and the body tends to be dry and rough. Kapha people can eat nuts directly. Even pitta people should pre soak their nuts. Because the fire is high, they cannot break down the skin of almonds. They should always have pre-soaked, peeled almonds. These are the types. So remember that nobody is the same body type. So what is good for you is not good for you, not good for you. Does that make sense? Yeah. But if any nutritionist is giving you a diet chart that is one size fits all, you know this is not deep research. It's still on the surface. It's superficial. Sprouts. Again, sprouts comes in this category of grains and pulses, but it's, if it's pre-soaked overnight, then you can have it after food. Have at least one piece of apple. Even if you don't like fruits, have at least one piece of apple. One small pear, one peach, one strawberry, one plum. In the morning. After that, wait half an hour at least, or 60 minutes. I usually wait 60 minutes for the food to get completely digested. I wait for a gurgling noise from the stomach, and then I eat my next meal. Listen to your stomach, it's constantly giving you signals. If it's not ready for the next meal, don't put the next meal ready. Sometimes, you know what I do? I have just teas and fruits and I go to work directly and I have my breakfast at work. Because by then, I have an appetite. Which means I'll not put on weight in this region. If you want to avoid putting on weight in this region, wait till you get hungry. Don't eat up. That's another thing. Yeah? We could make your fast in the morning. So just have Remember your body, your intestines is like a newborn baby. It's like a, would you wake up your child, give a 28 kg back as soon as the child wakes up and says, go down to school, we can't do that. You have to wake up the child with love.
feed him or her sandwiches to school, give it a nice bath, I mean, give him or her a nice bath, and then send them to school, right? Your stomach's just like that. As soon as it wakes up, you can't dump food in it. As soon as it wakes up, lubricate it with water and fluids first, teas, herbal teas, then some fruits, some probiotics, and active bacteria, and then put in some water breakfast. Wake it up slowly because your intestines is as fragile as a newborn baby. Have you seen a newborn baby's skin? It's as fragile as that, your intestines. Throughout your life. It doesn't harden up just because we become 30 and 40 and 50 and 60. What should we get in the morning? Fluids first, a cup of water. As soon as they wake up, because it helps in cleansing all the acids that have collected during the night, let the water wash away the acids. Then give them a little fruit to chew. Even if they don't like fruits, put some fruits in the mouth, let them chew, give them some almonds, give them some nuts. Let them go for the shower. As soon as they come out of the shower, then you give breakfast. Don't eat breakfast before the shower. Because you know if you eat breakfast and then go into the shower, you'll get bloated because the shower has stopped your metabolic fire. Always take a shower and just You can take a shower before bedtime but two hours after your supper or three hours after your dinner. Does it make sense? If I go take a shower with a full stomach, the shower will destroy your metabolic fire and actually come out feeling bloated. Bloating is indigestion. Indigestion is no metabolic fire, no digestion. Make sense? Very logical, right? Yeah. I know we're running out of time, so we should probably break for lunch. Uh, if you guys have more questions, I'm very happy to answer them in person. Uh, my visiting cards are available here. I'm going to pass them around if you guys want. And I've also given some complimentary consultation vouchers. You can come for all the Another 15 minutes? Because they start having the Okay, oh. we can take a few questions more then. Uh, yeah. yeah? You guys want to start ordering your lunch while we're talking? That's so that it doesn't delay them? Well, not everyone's staying. Okay. Do you have time for 10 minutes more? Okay, let's do 10 minutes more. Uh, if you guys have more questions, you have more questions. Yeah, that's good. That's, that falls in the water category. That's fine. At least give them two sips of water. Because there may be some acids that are collected here. So when you sleep flat, the acids from the stomach start coming up. You know, there was a case of my gynecologist, she said her daughter would keep coughing wherever she's sleeping. But during the day, she's fine. And then later, she gave a deworming tablet to the daughter. She realized that there were worms in the stomach that would crawl up to the throat and she'd keep coughing when she's lying down. But when she's sleeping, when she's awake and standing, it's fine. The worms are there. But worms are there in all our bodies. We all have malarial worms in our bodies. It does, it does crawl. Have you heard of tapeworm eggs in the brain? Yeah. Have you heard of those yeah. chronic surgeries? You know, if you eat a lot of uncooked cruciferous vegetables like yeah. cabbage, yeah. cauliflower, yeah. broccoli, what happens is there are worms in it that get ingested in the body which are invisible to the naked eye. Yeah. They can lay eggs which can get redistributed or recirculated into the brain. And if the eggs are deposited in the brain, it causes involuntary movement of the finger or the body. It can cause brain stroke, epilepsis, migraines. I was born with epilepsy when I was like what, zero days old. And I had epilepsy to the age of 11, which I've reversed thanks to Ayurveda. So be careful. When you wake up in the morning, give them at least two sips of water. Let the acids go down. Yeah? This is warm water. Warm water is good for others. If children don't like warm water, please remember children have very high intuitive intelligence compared to us. Listen to the child. If the child says, Mama, I don't like milk, Stop giving the children. Say, I don't like so many things. But initially, initially, listen to them. Listen to them. Let them get hungry and come back to them. Also, the problem that I have with Ayurvedic methodologies in this particular area is that there's so much of globalization. People are from different countries. We are living in different countries and stuff like that. So it's so, I don't know whether this Ayurvedic was sent towards India and the lifestyle to a tropical climate to the vegetables and legumes. Not, not true, not true. Uh, you're from India, right? Yeah. You have Indian roots. Yes. Yeah. So there's a lot of misconceptions that we ourselves as Indians have. And you know who introduced Ayurveda to me? My French friends. <coughs> the world is going in circles. The most advanced countries are now practicing Ayurveda. Unfortunately, we Indians are not practicing. I was introduced to Ayurveda by my French friends. In fact, we did a workshop here at uh, Santi Spa as well. You were there with the workshop. Sandra Lu was one of my students two years ago. And her friend, Lawrence Jakey introduced me to the concept of Ayurveda. Most advanced countries in LA, in California, in France, in um, Mexico, they, Mexico maybe is second world just like India. Most advanced countries are done being pumped with drugs and steroids and unresearched, uh, half-researched sites. They're all going back to nature for a reason. No, that's true. So nature exists around the world. Does nature exist only in India? No, I, I do not agree. So Ayurveda is based 
basically knowledge of life based on the city you're living in, based on the vegetables that are grown yeah. in the city. So there's a concept called eat local, live global. Yeah. Have you heard of that? Yeah. So when you're in India, eat vegetables that are grown here. Yeah. When you're in France, eat vegetables that are grown in France. I can't go in, eat Indian food when I'm living in France. It is going to mess up my digestive system. But that's called Ayurveda, right? Let me finish my sentence. That's called Ayurveda. Ayurveda basically means knowledge of life, and it basically means living as for the rules of the nature, the state and rhythm of the sun. The sun is same around the world. The sun is same in the US, in Europe, in India. So how is it different, the rules of nature? So they are saying that what to do in different places. You have to read. You have to research. It will not come in a capsule. It's not going to be easy. If you want to go back to your roots, you have to go through the pain of digging here. It's never going to be easy. But the roots, if the deeper, the uh, what do you call it? The deeper you dig your roots, the stronger the tree. Otherwise, even the lightest will be destroyed. Which is why, like, you know, when I was talking to Pablo, I said, you should talk in Spanish more often when you see some Spanish guests. He's like, yeah, but I wasn't sure. I said, take pride in your roots. Take pride in your roots. Listen to your grandmother. Listen to your mother. They have wisdom. Don't question it with modern science. Modern science is 200 years old or 300 years old and they're working progress. Nature is not one. Nature has fully understood itself. Nature knows how to grow itself. You're not telling this how to grow. It knows how to grow. But we need to learn from this how to grow healthy. Yes. So I say that sometimes it's better. Not sometimes. There are medicines called Pashma science. It's called mercury science, where they use medicines made from mercury. That is a very privileged science, and it's only for a small section of the population. Now, when you go to a hospital, God forbid, someone has a heart attack, the first thing they do is they give 10 milligrams of magnesium. Have you heard of it? They in immediately inject 10 milligrams of magnesium to stop the heart attack. But just because it stopped the heart attack, does it mean all of us should take it? Should all of us take 10 milligrams of magnesium every day? We shouldn't. Same thing with mercury-based science. It is only for certain diseases and a very small section of the population. It's not for everybody. Ayurvedic medicine, high risk powder, 
We made sure it had no preservative in it, like the metals. Are we get it from a good source. And within two years, his galvanized stones have dissolved. Oh, he's serious. I have called galvanized stones. Yeah. And I used to try to Go to the right source. Like I said, your source is not correct. You have been going to commercial big brands, big companies. Any other questions? Or we'll break for lunch because you know they're getting late. So, ladies, yeah. No, I just wanted to question. How is it that you go about starting to do the paper and you think to yourself like, oh, it's really hard to do? Come, come to the doctor. No blood. Just conversation or yeah. observation. That's how you decide who falls into what category. Because here I'm not able to touch each one of your hands but doing conversation. So this this is an interesting question. We've actually given consultation vouchers to all of you to come and do a complimentary pulse check. So what we do in the clinic is we check the pulse of the body and we check the heart rate of course to find out what body type you are. Plus you also tell us your family history and your own history of symptoms. And then we understand what body type you are. We also get to know what body type, your organs, your intestines, your gallbladder, your kidney, as well as the kapha, the kawata, we get to know the that. So right now, because it's a big group and I'm not able to do individual consultations, we did a test. So this is conversation based. This is still, which is still scratching the surface. And then we do a personalized diagnosis. That's when we come to know exactly what the body type is. So you're free to come, do a complimentary consultation wherever you like. The diet chart is chargeable, but the consultation itself, the diagnosis is free. I've also given a seven-day course service uh, club card if anybody's interested in studying further. Yeah? Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you to the folks. And thank you. So glad. Okay. Really, really enthusiastic. Yes. Yeah. Um, just wanted to make some very quick ACIW announcements. Um, we are selling tickets today.